um, that as a school and as a university, we are hosting uh, this public lecture by Governor Desita Kanyaho. I'd like to thank you for uh, taking time out of your out of your day, a precious part of the day, the morning, uh, to come and uh, and grace uh, this event with us. Uh, we, the theme of today's uh, public lecture is monetary policy, growth and jobs in South Africa. I'm going to outline the proceedings uh, and then we will have our vice chancellor and principal, uh, Professor uh, Zeblon Vilakazi, to introduce uh, the governor and to make a few uh, remarks. After he has done so, uh, he will call uh, the governor up on the stage to deliver his uh, public lecture. And then we'll take three minutes uh, on uh, a dialogue uh, on his speech, and then we'll open up uh, for discussion. I'd also like to welcome those who are joining us uh, online. Uh, please feel welcome and do send us your questions and comments on the chat, and we are uh, we will be picking up on on those. Without further ado, I'd like to call uh, the vice chancellor and principal of the University of Bedwaterstrand, uh, Professor Vilakazi uh, uh, Zeblon Vilakazi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the director of this very important school of government. I'm talking about serious importance given where you guys are coming. I hope you can hear me at the back. Governor Lester Hanyago, distinguished guests, members of the academic community, participants who are joining us online, ladies and gentlemen, as Vice Chancellor and the principal of this. University, which, as you all know, turns 100 this year and has uh, played a key role in the development of this city, this country, and by extension, this province, indeed, the world. I'd like to welcome you to the public lecture given by the esteemed governor, one of the, the consummate civil servants I know uh, since I joined uh, the public space myself as well, more of whom we'll hear later. My task is but to introduce Governor Hanyako. The theme of your lecture is timely in that it relates to the major economic challenges of our time, given the global situation we find ourselves in. Indeed, there are no easy answers. And I took an, I take an extract from one of the um, uh, intellectuals of your that who, whose quotation is very apt, given who we are. Our democracy, indeed, global democracy is a pressure. We have very few strong institutions. It was in this very context that the last 10 years of what we went through as a country, or rather uh, uh, 10 years prior, uh, allowed successfully target key institutions precisely to undermine the democratic, uh, democratic ideals outlined in our constitution. Our institutions are the antibodies that we put a protector against this corrosion and cancer. We are fortunate, notwithstanding all of this, that we have some of the institutions that have become the beacons of light and hope. Institutions that see beyond the cloud and the dust, but with laser precision focus on the matter at hand. Beth and the South African Reserve Bank, I'd say that Beth, I'm proud to say, is one of those independent institutions that seek, that speak to the power and seek light from the noise. As we celebrate our centenary, as I mentioned earlier, it is important for us to acknowledge other such centers of excellence beyond just the academy in a society. The South African Reserve Bank has been the epitome of good governance and for and fair policies which are much uh, aligned to our constitution. Even the fact that the world has just withstood uh, a global pandemic, the severe lockdowns in China at the beginning of 2020, which has had a disruptive on livelihoods and lives affected the global supply chain and created demand shock. The recent uh, situation in Russia, the invasion of Ukraine, 
has triggered spikes in energy and food prices, leading to central banks around the world tightening monetary policy, stabilize prices, and defend the integrity of currencies. These geopolitical events and their economic consequences do not seem transient. They suggest that the world is going through an inflection point that we've never witnessed before World War II, 1939, the invasion of Poland by Germany. And leading economists such as uh, Noriel Rubini note, I quote, unquote, you are facing a regime change from a period of relative stability that Britain would post war two years into a severe, a period of severe instability, conflict, and chaos. Those quotes. These are the cold realities that we as leaders need to face, confront as leaders, we need to tackle them. You've seen what happened in 1929, the Great Depression, which followed the 1929 market crash, 1930 depression, which gave rise to the NATO and, and other forms of fascism in Europe. And the risk, therefore, means that you are inter interdependent as the world economy. In this time, governor, we need courage, which comes from the French need from the heart, courage. We must have heart to tackle the problem and not be frightened by populism. Our country is concerned by extended periods of long growth, rising unemployment, especially among the youth. As you all know, numbers speak about the projected GDP of 1.6%, which for a development economy is near disastrous. Just before I hand over to Professor Dr. Kanyako, I'd like to say a few words about a quotation I got from Gustav de Bon, about our, whose book I read this week. He talks about types of psychology. Gustav de Bon was a early 20th century French psychologist of the school of the me of the uh, Jung and the, he says crowd psychology acts like a hypnotic and the individual finds himself in the hands of the hypnotizer. The activity of the brain being paralyzed in case of the hypnotized subject, the latter becomes a slave to the unconscious activities of his spinal cord, which the hypnotizer directs at you. The conscious person has therefore vanished. All the discernment and reason are gone. The feelings and thoughts are bent by the direction determined by the hypnotizer, AKA the populist. That therefore you have get caught into this mass hysteria. That the masses in that collective where people are caught in that mass hysteria, don't thirst for the truth. They thirst for sweet and simple solution. They turn aside from evidence. That is not in their taste. Preferring to deify error, make error some kind of a debate and a truth. The error to choose them to whoever can supply them with illusions that their master can easily give to them. So to attempt to destroy those illusions is seen as an act of terror. So being a governor of the Reserve Bank, your job is not an easy one. To give a pickup here and to sell those illusions. Over to you, Gavin. Good morning. Um, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Giravazi, uh, Professor Bobo, um, all professors of that. And, um, and thank you very much for, uh, uh, for the invite. The last time we, uh, uh, this uh, similar lecture, uh, we were under complete lockdown, couldn't come and do it from here and we have the problem that professor zobo uh, got load shared and uh, and he was deciding and an emergency had to be created somebody else had to uh, to take over i don't even know whether they had the script but i think it was professor habib who decided to, uh, to take over at that time uh, by the time we came back uh, so we decided that we would do it uh, physically so uh, good morning um to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I uh, was said, uh, I'm going to talk about monetary policy, growth, and jobs. 
of central banks as institutions are important long-standing expressions of a universal need for stability in social and economic affairs. Their goals center on achieving some definition of price stability, and in more recent decades, their methods have fixed primarily on inflation targeting. Where they directly target inflation, the primary tool of central bank is the policy rate, normally defined as a very short term or overnight borrowing rate. At this rate, banks can borrow from the central bank to address overnight needs for liquidity and this marginal borrowing rate sets the basis for all other lending rates in the economy. A secondary policy goal is a blend of communications about current economic conditions and the policy rate level. A secondary, um, a, a third encompasses the requirements and flexibility of the policy framework, the target itself, and how it is measured. In more recent years, and under the impact of deflationary conditions, a few advanced economies, central banks, have adopted their approaches with secondary targets, such as inflation averages over time and unemployment rates. Today, I want to spend some time unpacking why it is useful for the South African Reserve Bank and most emerging market economies generally to target inflation. And why achieving that goal ensures that monetary policy includes economic growth and job creation. I will look at recent uh, changes in policy targets from, uh, for the moment before returning to current conditions and the relevance of jobs and growth targets for monetary policy. It is useful to start with the global economic shocks of the past 15 years and their monetary policy implications. While the global financial crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic had different origins, the economic policy responses to them were similar. Advanced economies reacted to both by dropping interest rates as far as possible and using quantitative uh, easing. During the global financial crisis, quantitative easing programs kept asset prices of various kinds higher than they would otherwise have been, preventing asset price deflation from causing even worse economic outcomes. And during the pandemic, quantitative easing additionally supported spending as mobility and many face-to-face -face economic transitions were curtailed while also protecting financial institutions. Job creation was also a major focus for major central banks, and job creation became a measure of their policy effectiveness. More liquidity would help keep interest rates low, enabling firms to keep paying wages and to restart the economy. What impact have these efforts made on policy frameworks? Setting where countries face collapsing growth and weak, weaker inflation together, they, would, they could all move policy in the same direction. However, when the global financial crisis ended and the pandemic ended, not all faced the same policy traders. The global financial crisis um, itself ushered in an extended period of ongoing quantitative easing and low rates. But this was not true for most emerging market economies. The end of the pandemic has been different. It has thrown us all back into a pre-great moderation world in which inflation is super sensitive to supply and demand shocks. In particular, and with the benefit of hindsight, the current global inflation finds much of its origin in a too aggressive use of quantitative easing and in negative real rate as the pandemic started to wind down and economic activity rose. 
as in imagine uh, economists post a uh, global financial crisis, many countries now post pandemic find their output gaps to be badly measured and giving off incorrect signals about their policy systems. As and if the current surge in global inflation wanes, some advanced economies may very well return to lower inflation for structural and demographic reasons. Use central banks may retain other metrics in their policy frameworks, such as economic growth rate or the prices of specific assets, for example, house prices in New Zealand or in the case of the United States, employment levels. But it is highly unlikely that emerging market economies will decide to change their policy framework. Many had reverted to much higher inflation even before the pandemic uh, is, while others like South Africa are now caught up in broader inflation. In a context of normal conditions, the standard monetary policy approaches made as much of a positive impact on economic growth and jobs as they, can, as they can. However, the real solutions to faster growth and job creation lie in other policy domains. So, why the difference between advanced and emerging economies? And why might the rules governing objectives differ somewhat? The answer has to do with pure economic theory, actual experience, and with the different economic conditions, both cyclical and structural, faced by different central banks. To begin, it should be clear that for quite some time, Essentially, since the early 2000s, central banks of advanced economy have faced stubbornly low inflation despite low interest rates for a range of structural reasons related primarily to demographics and high savings. So when they look, when they took an accommodative stance to raise growth and employment levels during the great moderation of the 2000s and the period into the pandemic, inflation still remained modest. As the pandemic hit, because inflation remained low, there was as yet no contradiction between the inflation targets and boosting growth. Policy expansion could help get people who had dropped out of the labor market back in. Job creation was efficient. Expansionary stances worked well with strategies that lowered the cost to firms of setting, of retaining people in their jobs. In South Africa's case, the pandemic also facilitate, facilitated expansionary policy precisely because inflation had trended lower from 2017. This allowed us to lower policy rates sharply in 2020 to confront the shorter term damage done to the economy. The repurchase rate averaged 6.7% between 2017 and early 2000, before dropping to 3.5% in March, April of that year. As in advanced economies, our expansion did little to immediately bring back jobs. Many were lost as lockdowns were extended, while some new ones were created in various services linked to the shift in consumption patterns. Expansion did support the recovery of both pre-pandemic spending patterns and many of the jobs associated with them. Of course, there is also much further to go as some sectors remain constrained. The open question is whether sustained expansion in an environment of high debt levels and rising inflation could live up to the hope of those that argue for a jobs mandate for monetary policy. 
The short answer is no. But let me explain why. Our basic problem is that while growth creates jobs, inflation does not. Not only does this fatally challenge the belief many hold in the existence of a usable Felix curve, it also limits what macroeconomic policy can achieve in terms of job creation. As we have noted many times in the past, the solutions to our unemployment problem lie well outside the realm of monetary policy. And in fact, the failure to employ those solutions directly limits the positive contribution monetary policy can play. Let's look at what the historical data tell us about Felix curves. We see two correlations. One is that as inflation rises, unemployment rates rise. This characterizes the late 1990s and into the latter half of 2003. In 2002-2003, for example, inflation reached double digits in South Africa, even while employment was falling when unemployment reached 30 percent. From about 2003 to 2007, however, we see another correlation where inflation falls and employment rises. After the global financial crisis, from about 2011 to 2019, we see something different. Inflation first came off the highs of the global financial crisis and then accelerated back up towards around 6%. There was some initial recovery in jobs, but as time went on, the acceleration was increasingly located in the public sector rather than in the private sector. Economic growth weakened quite sharply from 2013 to 2015, and then more gradually slowed through to the pandemic. Through the, uh, to the pandemic. From 2017 onwards, inflation decelerated and so did job creation. The global financial crisis and the pandemic were relatively clear instances where policy could respond in terrific ways to support the economy and see through inflation shocks. Before and after these crises, we see more transparency the longer term relationship between inflation and job creation. Firstly, inflation does not create jobs. And second, on balance, expansionary policy prompts more inflation than growth or jobs. This tells us that South Africa's public care is near vertical at a low rate of positive economic growth. This is strong evidence that the basic job creation mechanism is being impeded by things other than aggregate demand. This adverse relationship between policy expansion and inflation kicks in when employment levels rise above what is called the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, naive as it is called. Evidence for South Africa shows that this happens when unemployment rate is still very high. This is exacerbated by level changes in the Nairu caused by structural impediments to job creation. For instance, load shedding or higher transport costs indirectly increase the cost of creating jobs and push up the Nairu. A range of uh, long-standing factors contribute to our very high nine. Perhaps the most important of these is where people live and the cost of supplying their labor as well as the skills they have compared to their cost. Regulatory costs of our economy also feature in various ways, including housing where, housing where businesses can ply their trade and compliance 
which is a much larger burden for small and medium-sized businesses compared to that of larger firms. Part of the difficulty is that we have done little to make it easier for less skilled workers to find jobs or make it less costly to employ them. Another part of the falling job creation machine is simply weaker real economic growth compared to the 2000s when job creation was relatively strong. This should not, however, lead us down the path of grasping at another seemingly easy answer. Higher inflation will not get us higher sustainable growth. Instead, inflation undermines short run growth by increasing interest rates on borrowing, affecting consumers buying on credit, and business owners who want to use credit to invest. Higher interest costs reduce short run cash flow reducing all future consumption spending. While surprise inflation reduces the real value of existing stock of debt owed, the trade-off is lower economic growth in subsequent years. The short-run benefit of a surprise lower interest rate is transformed by higher inflation into a long-run cost when inflation is higher than that of our trading partners, we suffer a continuous loss of competitiveness. Higher inflation overall also generally means higher inflation for poorer and less skilled South Africans than the women. This increases inequality further and worsens the already low standard of living for those households making them costlier to employ. But a few years before the global financial crisis in 2008, the relationship between growth and employment was better. If economic activity grew by 1%, employment grew by 0.62%. If economic activity grew by 1%, employment grew by around 0.6%. Yet, there had been a narrative that said we could have, or we had as South Africa, jobless growth. The reason we are not having jobs now is precisely because we are not growing. So since that period uh, leading to 2008, and up to 2018, each percentage point improvement in growth now only gives us 0.3% more jobs. Our low employment problem overlaps entirely with our low growth. In this context, the best a central bank can do is stabilize unemployment at a rate consistent with price stability. If a central bank attempts to get unemployment below the nine, the result will be larger quantities of inflation, but only small and temporary quantities of jobs as the supply curve becomes more critical. The same is true for economic growth. Assuming that most of our unemployment problem is structural. Are we at least sure that the residual cyclical unemployment is being reduced by monetary policy? Is a dual mandate better at addressing this cyclical driver? At the South African Reserve we use an alternative measure of economic activity to the Nairu for understanding where the economy is relative to its tipping point into more inflation or into deflation. This is the output curve, which measures the distance between 
the possible or potential growth rate of the economy and the actual or realized rate of growth. Think of the potential growth rate as the speed limit on the road. A skilled driver might be able to drive faster than the speed limit. But there are consequences. You could face death or even jail for running faster than the speed limit. If an economy runs faster than its potential growth, the consequences are higher inflation and subsequently even lower growth. Similar to the United States Federal Reserve, we use what is called a Taylor rule to help tell us what the interest rate level should be given the output gap and the distance between the inflation rate we want and where it currently is. The Taylor rule tells us that we should not, we should set an interest rate that includes how quickly or slowly the economy is growing compared to the speed at which it could be growing. If the output gap is a good representative measure of the cyclical unemployment rate, then we are fully covered. The monetary policy equation we use to get to the interest rate includes at best we can the relationship between growth rate and employment. If we look at how the Fed operates, we can take further comfort in our own framework. The Fed has an inflation target of 2% averaged over time. This averaging introduces some flexibility, but flexibility to not respond to inflation shocks that are temporary, just as in our flexible inflation targeting framework. But the third framework does not say that when un unemployment rate rises, it, must, it will aim for a higher inflation rate. In other ways, the dual mandate recognizes that in the long run, the highest cyclical employment rate is consistent with low inflation. In the policy debate at present in the US, there may be a rise in cyclical unemployment to get inflation back down and to achieve a lower sustainable unemployment rate. We also need to be cautious in our current circumstances. With, it, with surging inflation in advanced economies, it is likely that the adjusted policy frameworks of recent times will shift back to simpler and clearer formulations. There are three takeaways from this discussion that stand out. One is that inflation targeting central banks also consider real variables such as growth and unemployment when they make monetary policy decisions. The South African Reserve Bank is no exception. Second, that central banks don't drop targeting inflation even if they have an employment mandate. It simply means they respect the Nairu and discuss more directly its level and what can happen to inflation when the speed limit implied by it is exceeded. That thing is that despite some policy innovation in recent times, in some advanced economies, these may well be scaled back to simpler frameworks. Finally, we need to recognize for the sake of solving our low employment problems and to keep monetary policy focused on the right things that many issues sharply limit the transmission from policy to job creation. One is the job intensity of growth which we discussed. Another is the supply of skills that are coming into the market and their cost. Some might argue that in that case, it means that monetary policy should be pushed much further and harder to get the expected growth of jobs. Unfortunately, with 
inefficiencies and constraints, when inefficiencies and constraints exist, pushing harder on monetary policy is like pushing hard on the accelerator on a curvy, icy road, old road over a mountain pass. At present, many central banks are speeding on that ice with global inflation sharply higher than possible. Even our own relatively benign recent inflation experience has become much more challenging very quickly. We have seen now that having two targets certainly does not mean double the benefit. Instead, it means that there are times and certain conditions when one policy tool helps to achieve both. It also means that under other conditions, one tool cannot achieve both. And much of the world has now entered this territory, a policy level. When policy becomes overloaded with too many and contradictory objectives, then negative outcomes are more likely. As inflation rises and growth slows down, a central bank that fails to respond to the rising prices will face the prospect of compounding inflationary shock, currencies depreciate, and investment. So, where in all of this does South Africa find itself? We have not reached the end of our policy rate space. We do not have stubbornly low or close to zero inflation. We are experiencing high inflation that has been rising for the best part of the year. Inflation expectations, for the most part, are proving to be more responsive to the current inflation outcomes than we would like, and less anchored around the midpoint of our time. If the expectations that firms and households hold for future inflation stay stray from the inflation target, then higher nominal wages and consumer prices are likely to emerge. In other words, Once inflation expectations rise, they become a self fulfilling prophecy, and the central bank has a more difficult and longer term problem. A more expansionary policy stance runs that risk by enabling first round in inflation to embed into second round inflation. Put simply, you see prices rise. And because you see prices rise, you ask for higher wages. And because you are asking for higher wages, the firm raises its prices again, and then you are caught in that cycle. The central bank's job is to break the cycle. This implies that we need to continue the normalization of interest rates, moving them closer to the level that is consistent with more stable inflation rate and sustainable rate. At present, our repo rate is at 6.25%, still below long-term levels, but rising to a more sustainable long-term level that is consistent with inflation stabilizing at 4.5%. So let me conclude and look forward to the engagements. As we have discussed today, Neither growth nor high inflation lead directly to job creation in our economy. Much of our employment challenge lies in encouraging the return of economic activity in sectors that have been hardest hit by the pandemic. And we will also need to recognize that more jobs may be permanently lost as firms do things differently and as consumption patterns shift. Other jobs will be created and permanently impacting on employment levels requires approaches that have nothing to do with monetary policy. 
just adding jobs, targets, will not get us there. And indeed, part of our inflation problem stems from efforts to achieve such targets at a global level. We should be careful not to add to our policy objectives in a way that surely would push us into sharply higher inflation. If these are the primary constraints to job creation defined by the literature and monetary policy has no impact on them, then the claim that more expansionary policies will solve the unemployment problem is simply an empty promise backed up by little more than ideology and wishful thinking. We have an unemployment problem that needs more credible solutions. Employment and growth are both limited by factors that are beyond the reach of the central bank's toolset. The best chance we have with monetary policy to get faster, more job-rich growth is to maintain our focus on price stability with flexible inflation targeting and proven framework. This enables the South to help maintain a stable environment that is conducive to economic growth. And because credibility is high, for it to create the necessary flexibility to ignore short term inflation shocks. A credible monetary policy will also keep borrowing costs low. This is a central benefit to long term economic growth and job creation. When inflation rises and stays high, investment decisions are distorted towards short-term investments that carry with them short-term jobs. For this reason, low inflation is a sound developmental policy. It encourages firms across the private and public sector to make long-term investment decisions that imply productivity growth over time. This is critical, indeed, a prerequisite for sustainable jobs and income growth. Consumption based on rising debt levels cannot be a sustainable growth and development strategy. Having faced the unique threat of COVID-19 crisis, we confronted that challenge with relatively low stable inflation and policy space. We were able to soften the damage of the crisis with the policy rate while still protecting the value of the rent and in so doing, we were able to play our part in maintaining macroeconomic stability. Now that the global economy is recovering and inflation in many countries, including our own, is rising, we have learned from experience that we must not be tempted to loosen our grip on inflation or to fall behind our peers as rates are normalized. The consequences will be too costly and if we are faced with this, we need a conversation with society. A conversation we need with society. But yes, there are trade offs. And trade offs must be made. There is no such thing as a trade Thank Uh, thanks, Governor, for um, such a packed uh, lecture uh, that explicates on uh, multiple challenges that the world faces, and in particular, the tensions within our own uh, country. I, I just have a, a few questions before we open up uh, to the rest of the, of the audience. And uh, you talked about the, the trade-offs to be made, uh, the, the fact that uh, we can't have uh, free free lunch. Uh, some would wonder whether whether you you can give us some hopes of green shoots anytime soon. Uh, if you were able to place a timeline uh, on on that uh, to give us uh, some comfort that um, the era of uh, rising policy rates uh, will bear. Uh, green shoots uh, on growth and uh, stabilize uh, employment. Uh, when would that period be? It seems that um, uh, everyone is asking this question that you know the, the central bank governors around the world 
uh, they don't quite um, know what the end point is is going to be. I'm not sure if you've you've thought about this. Thanks. What we saw from the effects of those was that mining companies and mining employees started to pay significantly higher amounts of taxes uh, to uh, the South African, uh, the South African citizens. That enabled the treasury to pay down some of the debt. And as such, debt is picking up at a level lower than what was previously thought. I mean, when, uh, we gave the lecture last year. The talk was that debt could exceed 100% of, uh, uh, of GDP. Uh, by the time we got to the budget this year, it was like it will peak at about 80%, uh, uh, 75%. And now it is said that it will peak at 71%. So um, that basically means that South Africa has been able to rebuild its defenses to be able to face uh, to face uh, uh, whatever shock uh, that uh, that comes up, and it looked like um, we were getting back to the nice period because growth was rising, and at the time inflation was still uh, was still contained. Entered the war. Entered the war, and um, global supply chains were significantly disrupted, and um, and because global supply chains were disrupted and the economies were coming out of the lockdown, inflation was beginning uh, to rise and it was rising, it was rising rapidly. Um, for many in the advanced economies, um, uh, they, would not, they would not say it, uh, but the truth is that they are playing catch up. Uh, inflation has run way ahead, uh, uh, ahead of them. And, um, and, and, and that is what, so, so, so when I talked about that policy uh, dilemma, dilemma, where you are faced with a situation where growth slows down, but inflation is, uh, is rising, uh, you can't, if you decide that I am going to let inflation go, what's going to happen is that down the line, you are going to need even more aggressive policy adjustments uh, to bring down inflation. And when that happens, it comes at a cost to longer term growth. And so that is what, uh, that is what uh, we, uh, we had faced. Now, um, global, globally, advanced central banks, economy central banks are increasing interest rates. And because they are increasing interest rates, we are having a repricing of global financial uh, assets. So you are seeing money flowing back into the uh, into the US as their bond yields uh, arise, uh, but also the growth differentials are still favoring them uh, in, the, uh, in the in the US. So you will see capital flowing back into uh, into um, uh, uh, the US and other advanced economies. Where does that leave uh, like leave South Africa? What it says is that uh, we have got to be rebuilding our defenses. That is what you have seen uh, with the budget policy uh, statement uh, that has come through. Why is it important to rebuild our defenses? It's because 
globally, capital looks at distinguishing one country to the other. And they are looking at the policy framework and the countries with the less prudent policy frameworks get punished. And the experience of the past few weeks shows that it doesn't, that punishment is not confined to emerging market economies. If an advanced economy uh, adopts reckless policies, it too gets punished almost uh, instantly. Irrespective of whether it has a reserve currency or not, it gets punished, uh, it gets punished instantly. So it's important that we stay the course and make sure that our macroeconomic policy framework is prudent. Because we know that prudent macroeconomic policy served South Africa well going into the global financial crisis. We saw it, uh, it led to higher growth, it led to better job creation. And need I say that our macroeconomic policy from 2011 or 12, um, was not as prudent as it had been uh, in the past. And the results are, are there to say, to, uh, for everyone to see, because we couldn't rebound sustainably uh, after the global financial crisis. Part of it being that we didn't rebuild uh, our defenses. It was a very important lesson for South Africa uh, that uh, getting now, coming out of this crisis, that we are able to rebuild. You have loaded so many questions. Uh, uh, I, I, I hope you do not. Uh, yeah. Fiscal policies, uh, how dangerous these are. We saw uh, in the UK, uh, I think you were probably, um, without mentioning the country, referring to, uh, to the recent uh, troubles. Now, the, the couple of things. One is that there's an argument to be made that perhaps we should push a little harder on investment oriented um, uh, you know, fiscal spend uh, to, uh, to create an enabling environment or to crowd in the private sector. But also there are social tensions in, in South Africa, the rising levels of inequality, um, they're going to be pressures on the expansion of social protection measures uh, very soon. And perhaps paradoxically, uh, the levels of inflation will make the 350 social uh, relief um, for distress grant uh, insufficient. Uh, how do you see us playing these trade-offs, one, to maintain social stability but also uh, to make a push for investment drive. The reason I spent so much time talking about how we deal with uh, uh, the challenge of employment and unemployment has to do with the fact that the biggest source of inequality in South Africa is not that there are people who are paid too much and people who are paid too little. It's because we have got people who are paid and people who are paid zero the unemployed and that the, the unemployed makes our inequality situation even more pronounced and we can come with all sorts of other social policies to try and uh, deal with this they are transitory uh, in nature long term we need to get this country working and i deliberately said we must get this country working because we also need a conversation that says that when people come out of this institution, are they going to be job seekers or are they going to be job creators? And it's a very important conversation uh, for us to have. But let me also be clear about how dangerous you said expansionary, you said expansionary fiscal policy can be. Uh, expansionary monetary policy can be uh, as dangerous. But let's be clear. There are times when expansionary fiscal policy and expansionary monetary policy are necessary. And there are times when they become dangerous. When, are they, when do they become uh, necessary? When you have experienced sudden shocks and you need to temporarily lift um, a demand, uh, they, become, they become useful. What does history tell us? When this economy was pumping, uh, 
in the period up to 2008, uh, growing at, uh, at some stage at like 5.3% per annum, as I had said, for every 1% uh, growth, we were uh, 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 we were creating 0.4 percent in uh, uh, in jobs, and it was an era where it it was common to report that South Africa has created 300 500 thousand jobs. That was the era, and during that period, what was the stance of fiscal and monetary policy? It was contractionary. Uh, but we didn't call it contra contractionary at that time. We called it counter cyclical. It was acting counter cyclically, right? So we got into the global financial crisis with policy buffers because the treasury had even a budget surplus. Inflation was within the target. And so we could respond to the shock. And so it became necessary at the time to embark on expansionary fiscal policy. If my memory serves me well, the government at the time announced an infrastructure spend of 787 billion rand. Uh, what happened to the money is a subject of another day, uh, but that was the amount of money that was talked. It was expansionary, uh, expansionary fiscal policy. And, um, but as we got into, in, uh, after the global financial crisis, it was clear that prices were rising. And at the time, what we was talked was that we needed to come out of the thing. But now the stimulus has got to be temporary. You can't be permanently in a stimulus because remember you said you are acting counter cyclically. So it depends on, uh, on the cycle uh, that, you, uh, that you faced. When the pandemic hit us, there was dollar fiscal space. So the treasury couldn't go aggressive and respond in the aggressive manner that it responded in, in 2008, 2009. The burden fell on monetary policy. Why? Because monetary policy had the space. Inflation was low. And because inflation was low, we were able to adjust the policy rate, brought the interest rates down very quickly, including calling a meeting over the weekend uh, to, get it, uh, to get it done. Th that, is, that is what makes monetary policy more than just a science. It also becomes an art uh, that we had, to, we, had to do, we had to do that. But as inflation rises, you can't expect us to continue to adopt an expansionary monetary policy because otherwise, should we get be hit by another shock, we will not have the space to respond, uh, to, respond to that. Even with the adjustments in the policy rate as they stand, monetary policy still remains accommodative. Our policy rate is at 6.25%. Our inflation is at 7.5%. So our policy rate is below the inflation rate. So it is still in expansionary um, uh, territory. Put simply, what we have been doing was not to slam the brakes on the car. What monetary policy simply did was to take the foot off the accelerator. Now you had talked about uh, infrastructure. The lament of the Minister of Finance last week was that the infrastructure money went unspent. So it's not that uh, the money was not allocated, it was simply not spent. But you see, that was his lament, but uh, I, I will not question him about it. Uh, you've got to remember, uh, Governor, that uh, our memories are, are short. We, we forget good times. Um, just the last question uh, from my side, um, uh, and just to get your sense uh, of the how the global economy and global governance uh, systems are reconfiguring. And if we uh, remember history at the end of 1945, Second World War, we had the emergence of the Bretton Woods system. Uh, 1960, the intro 60s, the introduction of the, I think it was 69, the introduction of the special drawing rights. 1970, oil crisis and the collapse of the gold standard, 1980s, world recession and um, lost decade for Africa and uh, Latin America. One can go on and on. Uh, and if, uh, in each of these uh, crises, uh, the global economy is configured differently and global governance institutions take a certain uh, form. Now, fast forward and looking at where we are, we have 
uh, geopolitical frictions, uh, rising sovereign debt threat for, for many low-income countries. Um, and it doesn't seem that uh, the, the shocks, uh, the supply and demand shocks are, are going to end, especially if we see the bifurcation of global supply chains as, chi as tensions between China and the US are also intensifying. What, what is your prognosis uh, of, of global governance in future? And where do you place countries like South Africa and broadly the African continent in, in that uh, redefinition? Well, not my biggest strength, so I will narrow my response to uh, global institutions of economic governance. Um, and I would like to take this thing back. Uh, what in your period you didn't mention the Asian crisis in 1997 that uh, led to eventually the creation of the G20 and um, uh, uh, and uh, and the uh, 2001 Argentinian default. So 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 uh, those things, but. Here, here, here comes, uh, here comes the thing. You will always have this configuration. But getting into the global financial crisis, developing countries argued for a well-resourced IMF to be able to respond to crises. The advanced economies blocked it. And in the G20 summit in uh, 2009, temporary resources were availed to the IMF, uh, additional resources were uh, availed to the multilateral development banks, but the IMF was only given temporary resources. And the whole idea was that, oh, this is just a temporary thing and it happens once, I don't know in how many decades. In 2018, I was the chair of the IM, IMFC, the International Monetary and Financial Committee of the IMF. And we had as our agenda, the resourcing of the IMF. Again, there was a pushback from the advanced uh, economies. Entered COVID. The only time, I mean, it was like, okay, previously you could argue that countries get uh, um, in debt distress and the IMF have to step in. Here we are now, the crisis in 2020 was measured in human lives. People were dying. And that is how the IMF eventually uh, got additional resources. Unfortunately, in the manner in which these resources are allocated, they are allocated proportionately. And that meant that the bulk of the resources ended up with the countries that do not need those resources in the first place, okay? Um, and so a mechanism was being designed within the IMF where the special drawing rights could then be reallocated or temporarily to the countries that actually need them and need them the most. Secondly, it had been that as we were getting into the crisis, and I'm no epidemiologist, I am no health expert, nothing. As soon as there was any inkling that the vaccines are having prospects, they hoarded them. They hoarded them in the north, right? and prioritize their own thing. The problem is that this virus does not know boundaries and it just keeps on going. And then it, it was very simple. None of us are safe unless all of us are safe. I'm painting this because the world trade system is also facing a test with uh, countries declaring certain products as strategic. And you said, Prof, uh, it leads to bifurcation. Well, bi, I suppose, means two. But I actually see a multiplicity of this. Uh, uh, I don't know is uh, trifurcation or what. But, but I see a multiplicity uh, of this. And then I had learned last month, this very, very last month, a new term called friend shoring, which says that uh, countries decide that they are now going to trade with their friends. And uh, which then leads to um, a fragmentation of the wealth trading system 
where you had the World Trade Organization as the governing body that would have enabled us to resolve trade disputes uh, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, it doesn't matter how many economists you put in a room to make the argument, um, all those beautiful ideas will die at the altar of politics. And what needs to be sorted out is the global political governance. Otherwise, we will not be able to sort out those institutions. Yeah, that uh, ends on a grim note. Uh, let's um, let's take a, a few questions uh, from the audience and um, and and see what uh, um, you know. Yeah, let's 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 see. I think there's a gentleman over there. If you can also just introduce yourself briefly. Thank you very much. My name is Muzinkosi. Uh, just a quick question to the governor. <clears throat> I'll first start by making a statement that uh, inflation, as far as I understand inflation, inflation is a general increase in prices. Now, when you check South Africa, I just want to know from you, Kevin, is this inflation rate that you are giving to us driven by excess demand? Because if it's not, then it means that the instrument is fraudulent. I'll tell you why the instrument becomes fraudulent. If our inflation is not driven by excess demand, it means that now monopolies are taking advantage on the depressed economy by rising prices. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Currently, we are sitting with a situation where a price of five liter uh, cooking oil rose by 90%. That can be inflation. But when you do your figures, that becomes added to the basket. Two weeks back, the competition tribunal raided eight South African insurance companies because of price fixing. Those prices are also included on the same basket. So with that being said, that's why I'm saying, let us get rid of that instrument of inflation targeting because it's not going to get us anyway. Second point, Governor, 2020, when we started decreasing the repo rate, our inflation was sitting within your target because you, you're saying you're targeting between 3 and 6%. We're sitting at about 3.1. But you had the room to decrease the repo rate. And thank you very much for that. That was a job well done. Some of us, we managed to get into uh, the good housing market, but now you're killing us. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't even afford lunch because I'm, I'm hoping the organizers have organized lunch so that they can have some. It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad because I do not understand the increase at this point. Because if you were to say to me, this increase is caused by excess demand, then I will come and fight with you directly there in the stage. And it's not. So monopolies are taking advantage of this depressed economy and they're overpricing. What are you doing about that? There's simply nothing at this point. We know that Bonagele, the guy that heads competition tribunal, is sitting with a lot of cases. So there's too much price fixing on the market. Yeah. Last one that I want to give to you without wasting time. When the mass mart came into uh, the, South Africa, the South African malls, I'll, I'll give you an example of game. So normally in a mall, you'll have two, uh, supermarkets that are operating, which will have yeah. your pick and pay or checkers. They wanted to kick game out. And the reason being is was that game was very cheap. So the same shopping basket that I was uh, paying for at checkers and pick and pay, it was less at game. So this inflation yara yara nonsense must come to an end because we, we cannot tolerate it anymore. Yeah, sure. Thank Thanks. you very much. Just to maybe add a point to what this gentleman uh, has asked the governor, we, we've, you know, there's some who have also been making a point that, um, uh, you know, the, the prices have largely been driven by uh, energy prices, which has nothing to do with South Africa and, and more to do with uh, Europe, 
uh, woos. Maybe if you could shed light on uh, price fixing issues, um, artificial increases in prices, as well as uh, the flow through of energy prices from uh, from Russia, Ukraine war. Well, Muzi started well and then uh, uh, contradicted himself. <clears throat> you see, he, he said that the competition commission has been raging uh, people for price fixing. And then he turns around and he says, you are doing nothing about it. Uh, the, the, the point here is that the competition commission had to do that because that is exactly their remit to deal with market abuse, to deal with price fixing, that is exactly the role of the competition commission. And the competition commission is not uh, one person. Um, one Aguilar, my friend, has uh, uh, served his term. There is a new commissioner there, but that commission is working and we must allow it to do, uh, to do, its, uh, to do its job. So, so, so there might be market concentration in the South African market does lead to unnecessarily high prices. That means that those must be dealt through appropriate competition policy. And I think the Competition Commission is doing a good job. Uh, so I will, not, uh, I will not venture there. Let's deal with your uh, assertion about the origins uh, of, uh, 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 of inflation. When you experience a shock, like a fuel price shock and a food price shock. What central bankers do is to not respond to that inflation. We don't, and we actually didn't. What we do is to see whether that shock becomes permanent and respond to the, the effects, the, what we call the second round effects of that shock. And in my talk this morning, I talked about how there was a debate among central bankers about whether the shock is transient. And central bankers in April uh, in Washington, when we were meeting, uh, we were divided into two camps. There was what was called team transitory and team permanent. And team transitory thought that they had it. When we went back now in October, there was no team transitory. We had all become team permanent. Why? Because inflation has moved from being that temporary shock to spread into something else. How do we know that inflation is no longer that temporary shock that it is more transient? In South Africa, like it's done elsewhere in the world, we take from the inflation basket and remove those two volatile items being food and energy. We remove them and say, if we remove them, where is inflation? And the reason why throughout 2021, when uh, the other emerging markets, mainly in Latin America, were increasing interest rates, Brazil started increasing interest rates in May uh, uh, last year. Um, uh, just in, uh, for uh, thing, if you think we have been aggressive in our interest rates, uh, Brazilian policy rates are at 11.775 uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, they started in March um, uh, last year. And so, so why didn't South Africa then respond in March like Brazil? The reason we didn't respond in March like Brazil was that when you remove those two volatile items, the inflation that is remaining, what we call core inflation was contained. And it remained contained throughout the year. And as a result of that, there was no need for monetary policy to increase interest rates. But by the time we got to November, we saw evidence that the increase in prices have moved away from food and fuel, and it was starting to spread itself into, uh, into other prices. How does it spread itself into other prices? There are a couple of things. The, Lower deciles of our income earners spend a lot of money on food. And so when uh, inflation goes up and it's driven by food prices, for them, the headline inflation means nothing. Their immediate inflation is what they see. Put simply, inflation erodes the buying power of 
the population. And if the authorities do not step in and contain inflation, we are selling our people short. We have got to deal uh, with, uh, we have got to deal with inflation. So there is evidence now in our inflation dynamics that showed that core inflation is rising. And actually in our forecast, we expect that core inflation will rise close to five, just to just over 5% uh, into, the, into the next year. And that actually headline inflation might even be coming down faster than uh, core. The reason, uh, if there are statisticians in the room, are mainly base effects because uh, these increases that we saw this year, next year you calculate the increase on a higher base and so uh, 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 the effect comes, uh, uh, comes, uh, uh, comes lower. So inflation has become uh, spread, uh, spread now beyond those headline uh, things. And do you say that, well, if it is not from the demand side, do not respond. Well, I used this metaphor. If a snake enters your house, you don't ask the snake, are you from the demand side of the forest or are you from the supply side of the forest? You have got to manage the, the fact that the snake is now here. You have got to now manage it. And, um, and, and that is what, uh, that is what uh, we face. And the decisions that we are going to make are going to be uh, difficult. There are trade-offs that we make and, and that's what we, that, that is what we are uh, tasked with. Sure, tough job, uh, Governor. Um, let's take uh, two last questions uh, before I read the ones from, the, from online and then we'll allow you, Governor, to, uh, to close. Uh, no, 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 please, please, we still have time. But if we just has a point of clarification, uh, I'm not talking yeah. about. No, no, no. I mean, I'm talking about. Okay. This is a place of extractive skills. Russia said that I think the central thread there is definitely something. All right. So thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Um, otherwise, I mean, great points you you raised. Um, couple of people have raised uh, similar points and I think you know we don't have sufficient time to uh, to explore uh, all all of them but there are serious trade-offs uh, you know between I mean the house those who are entering the housing market for the first time are battling um, to uh, to access the housing market and these are middle classes but then you also have to think about those at the bottom uh, who are earning or earning very little or with no income, and uh, and and we 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 have to think about how you uh, how to st stabilize prices. I mean, those are the decisions you you have to take, Governor. And let's take this. Um, let me just see this side. I'll take uh, TK uh, at the back. I know his name because he's my colleague. Um, and then we'll take uh, the the gentleman uh, here. Uh, and then we'll read from the chat and allow you, Governor, to make uh, your closing statements. Oh. Uh, good morning and uh, yeah. uh, good morning, Governor. Thank you. It's not my voice, I'm very sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a bit of a more mandy voice. Uh, I just have uh, just two quick questions. Uh, one is, I know you loathe to do predictions, so I'll ask you a historical question. If you maybe could just give us insight as to where do you see the period we are in? Are we in the 1979 period where we had, uh, I think, Paul Volcker come in as a US Fed chair, where it was just high inflation? And if that's the period you think we're in, uh, what lessons can we learn? Because I think uh, for America, I think it went up all the way to 19, the interest rate. So I just wanted, if you could just give us insights as to historically, where is your mind and where do you see the current problems we're in? Uh, secondly, uh, Larry Summers speaks about the need to take advantage of the crisis that we're in. And I know it's not necessary within your portfolio to do, but if you were to take a shot to say, how do you take advantage of this crisis? Or how do you give advice to take advantage of this crisis? And lastly, if I may take maybe privileges of being in, coming from uh, the School of Governance, uh, looking, if you can answer the historical question, answer the question of how do we take advantage? Do you think the South African Reserve Bank going forward in a period of uncertainty is dynamic enough to really lead a population in the problems we're facing with new types of instruments, understanding, as you correctly say, that, look, what we really are dealing with in South Africa is a question of poverty and unemployment. 
And does the Reserve Bank really speak to that language and do we have the right instruments going forward to be able to take advantage and really bring South Africans into a different type of dynamic? So thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, um, is there like a minimum number of times and a maximum number of times uh, you, you as the Reserve Bank can uh, um, basically intervene in like managing the economy via the interest rates? Because um, the last few years, there's been um, a number of opportunities or situations where um, it was warranted that you guys uh, get involved in uh, managing the economy. And I just want to find out, like, what's that uh, threshold of um, number of times you guys in can intervene in, in a year? Because um, it's gone with the high inflation as well. They are a big contributor to the high standard of living in South Africa right now. And also the international uh, conflict between Ukraine and Russia as well. Then my second question has to do with more about the state owned bank. Um, does that make sense to you? And um, what is the right conditions for a state-owned bank for South Africa to exist? Okay. So, uh, Thanks. Let me um, also just read the ones from the chat. Well, can uh, we, could we, uh, the, I, 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 I oh, okay, no, taking, that's all right. That's, I, I've that's not been right. taking uh, notes. I'm, I'm training my mind to remember things without writing them. So, so, uh, so I just wanted to take, uh, to take uh, That's right. let me start with the easier one because the TK's uh, question is uh, very loaded. Um, it's up to trust TK, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so let's start with the, with, the, uh, with the last one. There isn't a limit of how many times a, a central bank can uh, take uh, its action. I think the US schedules eight meetings a year um, uh, where they deliberate on the policy stance. We schedule six. Uh, but in 2020, we had seven meetings. And the reason was that in the middle of a crisis, you can't wait for the next meeting. You can call an emergency uh, meeting. And that is, uh, that is exactly what we did. Why did we call an emergency meeting in 2020? Well, we were working on the basis that the country was under lockdown for 21 days. And then, boom, the president announced that the lockdown is extended. And then we decided we can't wait. Let us meet uh, uh, urgently. Um, uh, we normally meet for like uh, three days. Uh, we, we met for a maximum of four hours that, that day and we uh, took a decision and actually even announced the decision before, um, we before the press conference because once we said we are calling a press conference, uh, the people start speculating, why are they calling a press conference? So we announced the decision and then uh, did the press conference. So that's, uh, that, uh, that, that is what uh, 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 we would do in, in the... Uh, in the intervention. The last question that you had about uh, uh, the state bank, um, I think the state, like all the players, uh, has got a right to be involved in activity. And uh, the central bank uh, is a regulator of banks. We license the banks. So if the state wants to have a state bank, it must put in an application like all the others so that uh, that application of a state bank uh, uh, can take place. Um, of course, the question that South Africans must ask is what, what ill is the state bank trying to fix and, uh, um, and whether it would be able to, uh, to stand. Uh, uh, I do know that uh, banking is not cheap. They need a lot of money to spend on IT and the lots. Um, we had previously received an application for a state bank via the post, uh, uh, the post bank. We gave them a temporary license for uh, 12 months until they can sort out certain things. Uh, they didn't, that license has lapsed, so they must uh, put on a new, uh, a new application. So, so it's not our space as the uh, licensing authority to express a view about the viability or otherwise of a, a bank. So if the application comes and it meets the criteria, we will deal with it according to those criteria. So sure, thanks. Last set. Uh, oh, uh, TK's uh, oh, so, sorry, TK's questions. TK's, yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, well, but he said he's, he's asking the questions, but he knows the answer. <laughs> um, uh, so um, <laughs> no, the, the 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 era. So many of these eras are different. We can learn from each of the previous eras, 
I don't think that we would be able to characterize this era as like the Volcker era. The Volcker era just dealt with a, a rise in uh, inflation. Um, here, we are coming out of a pandemic. The last time there was a pandemic like this was uh, 1918 the, with the uh, Spanish uh, flu. And, um, and many central banks were not around then, including ours, which we only started operating in 2021. Uh, um, there were lessons from there, but not much for central banking uh, coming out of, uh, uh, out of that. What is in no doubt is that the current era had made the short-term short -term trade offs between inflation and uh, uh, growth much sharper. But more importantly, it also made the intertemporal uh, um, trade offs much sharper. Um, what you can't do in making policy is to allow the excesses of today's generation to put a burden on the future generation. So there's got to be intergenerational equity. So as we, even as we respond to uh, the inflation um, and we say that high, if we allow inflation to be high, getting into the future, it might undermine future growth. If we do not act and it undermines future growth indeed, you have just passed the problem to a future generation uh, which, would, uh, which would actually be, um, uh, be unfair. I hope that uh, 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 deals with your questions, TK. We can always continue them. So thanks, uh, Governor. To be fair to those joining us online, um, the, just really few questions, uh, uh, which I think you could take it uh, in one. The, the first is um, a central bank-backed uh, digital currency. Where is our central bank uh, in, in this? Uh, the second one is, um, is there a renewed role uh, for the new development bank, uh, given the crisis that's happening in, in the world to, today? Uh, the other is a cry uh, that um, uh, we are losing our homes due to high interest rates. Uh, how should we approach this? So we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and then you can make your closing remarks, Governor. OK. Um, uh... Let's start with the central bank digital currency is the, is the, uh, the easier one. Um, the question that we always ask ourselves as central bankers is, is a central bank digital currency a necessity or is it a solution looking for a problem? And, um, we decided that um, we are going to embark on a journey of learning. Money is a social good and everyone should have access to it, of course, legitimately. Our baseline as the South African Reserve Bank is that if we end up with a central bank digital currency, it will exist alongside uh, the, existing, uh, the existing currency. There are lots of things that you'd have to deal uh, uh, with. We ran um, an experiment on a wholesale basis of a central bank digital uh, currency with a project that we called Project COCA. Um, and we used the technology there. And then uh, subsequently, we did another experiment with the central bank of the, the Singapore Monetary Authority. And instead of going on the journey on our own, we decided to join a community of central banks led by the Bank for International Settlements. So various parts of the world study different aspects of uh, the central bank digital uh, currency. For all intents and purposes, on a wholesale basis, we have uh, this thing. So the big monies that move in uh, South Africa is all moved digitally. But there are also important aspects about cross-border nature of a central bank digital currency. What are the legal issues and all of that? So it's a complex area that uh, we are on a learning journey with uh, uh, the other uh, central banks. And lastly is 
what would be the role of this central bank digital currency for the retail market? Um, uh, uh, if it is digital, uh, to be serious, what happens when uh, there is load shedding? Right? And so one of the things then we are dealing with is that it needs to be um, possible for the digital currency to be available online and offline. So that if there is no electricity, you could still uh, uh, do um, trades uh, in, a, in a CBDC. It's a complex area that we, uh, we have been, uh, we have been uh, uh, exploring. The housing. Uh, the, the housing, I want to finish with is uh, uh, the, um, it's the, 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 the new development bank. The new development bank was the, the, the next question. Um, this is driven, the new development bank is driven by treasuries. Um, the central banks have got, it's not a bank, uh, but it's, it's something, it's an arrangement. We call it the contingency reserve arrangement. And in the contingency reserve arrangement, the central banks pool a certain amount of their reserves, uh, whereby if one of the countries in the BRICS would need access to uh, currents, foreign currency, it can access. And those currencies is the currencies of the BRICS countries. Um, to, so, so, so that is what, uh, uh, that is what we have. Um, and we run these simulations on a regular basis. And uh, uh, two of the most recent simulations couldn't take place. Why? Because Russia couldn't settle uh, because there are sanctions. So um, um, that is what uh, we have. And the uh, new development bank uh, itself had found that um, it would be difficult for them to lend money into Russia now uh, because Russia is, uh, Russia is sanctioned. So. Uh, these things have got to be located uh, within that global, uh, the global financial, uh, global financial system. Last question with um, uh, housing. I mean, <clears throat> let me first, before I get into housing itself and say, we hear the cries of South Africans. When South Africans are complaining about the rising cost of living, we hear your cries. We hear your cries when you say that inflation is eroding your income, whether it is the income in the form of a salary or in the form of the 350 that you are getting from government or some other grant from government. Erosion of that income by inflation is what the central bank should deal with. We hear those cries. But in dealing with your cries, there is going to be short-term pain. And that short-term pain, unfortunately, comes in the form of the medication that is interest rates. It's not going to be easy. There are no easy answers here. And it doesn't, we do not derive joy from people losing their houses or losing their cars. We do not derive joy from that. But we understand that we have to do this thing. It will be painful in the short term because we have got to deal with this medium term problem called inflation that is eroding the income of the South Africans. If we don't, we might end up in a different era. TK talked about the Volcker era. Let's talk about the South African era of uh, 1998, when interest rates went to 25.5%. And uh, South Africans were in all sorts of trouble. And we ended, ended there because inflation expectations were not anchored and inflation was rising. And the central bank almost needed to demonstrate that it could do uh, something about it. And it was also a very difficult era because during that era, we do not know what the focus of the central bank is. The central bank was trying to focus on uh, what was called an eclectic monetary policy, mm -hmm. trying to, one day they are worried about credit extension, one day they are worried about money supply, the next day they are worried about this. It was not clear what the anchor of monetary policy was. 
In 2000, the inflation targeting framework was introduced. Do yourself a favor and study the era of inflation targeting. Last year, this year, we are celebrating 21 years of inflation targeting. Um, and uh, uh, in that era, not last year, we celebrated 21 years of inflation targeting. In that era of inflation targeting, there is one common thing. Growth has been better. Might not be what the kind of growth we want, but it was definitely better than the previous eras. Two, inflation was lower. Three, interest rates were lower. Um, and every epoch, every shock, we just come out, we have learned, we come out better. And so in 1998, interest rates peaked 25%. In 2009, interest rates peaked at 12.5%. This, in this era, they will peak lower. I won't say where you were during that uh, era, Governor. <laughs> but uh, we, we're really, really out of time. Governor had pleaded earlier that the, um, he has another engagement in Johannesburg. Really want to thank you, uh, Governor Akhanyaho. This was fantastic. It was comprehensive highly engaging. Many people say you don't engage, you just lecture. Uh, I think, I hope, you know, they will change their minds. It was really great. Uh, and also just to thank the audience and those who raised uh, tough questions. Uh, as a university, we encourage robust de debates and we are going to bring you more of these. And, and also thank, thank, thanks to your team um, that worked so well with us, and 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 uh, thanks to Mane Eboikanyo, who's our marketing manager in the team she worked with, and uh, and also to thank the media contingent. Um, we've come to the end of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the support.